when you face difficulties, you do need to bounce back. It seems to me it's a very simple thing, but if you're in a difficult situation and you feel it's hopeless, then it may be that you have to accept that the situation is as it is, but there is always one thing you can do, and that is to change how you think about it. Welcome to I Share Hope, the podcast where world leaders share their real stories of hope and how you can use actionable hope to start changing your life today. And now, here's your host, Chris Williams. <clears throat> Hello, Chris. And Jones, how are you doing? I'm fine. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for talking today. I really appreciate your time. Fine. So it is 2 p.m. in the UK. Where exactly are you located? In a little village. Um, in the middle of Northumberland, oh. I can look out over a stream just rolling into the River Tyne. In front wow. of me. That's not even fair. That's so beautiful. Wow. We've never been to the UK, but my wife and I and our kids really want to visit there. Really do. Like Jill really does. She's, we hope to spend a month there at some point and just settle into somewhere, not in a big city, but just, just to relax and slow down. Mm. Oh. Sounds like you got a good place. Yeah. Yeah, it sounds like you've got a good plan. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. All right, Anne, so tell me this. If, if I'm correct, you have read Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows faster than anyone else on the planet. Is that true? Yeah. Well, I had to do it for... Um, I, I did it for um, fun, really, but in actual fact, I was asked to do it for um, Sky News yeah. and uh, various other newspapers. And I've stopped competing in world championships now. And what I do is, for fun, I sort of speed read um, books that uh, the press want to talk about. Okay. And Harry Potter wasn't my favourite book for speed reading. It was actually the um, Harper Lee book that came out in July. Huh. And I had uh, I finished that in 25 minutes and 31 seconds. And there's a huge group of journalists in the room and... Um, was filmed by a number of TV companies, including the BBC and Sky. No but way. such a great book um, and uh, a challenging read. I really enjoyed it. I, I, you know, I, I like Harry Potter. There's a lot of hype around that. Yeah. But I thought the uh, Go Set a Watchman book was a better read. Wow. So you, you read it in 25 minutes, 25 and a half minutes, basically. Yeah, but I trained hard for that, Chris. <laughs> well, when I say I trained hard, it wasn't hard. I basically, sort of, um, for about a month beforehand, I read To Kill a Mockingbird at a faster and faster speed um, every day. So my goal was to read To Kill a Mockingbird in about 45 minutes um, and to get a speed of about 10 pages per minute. And I was doing it for this particular event for a friend of mine who has a bookshop and she wanted to get some publicity, and she got massive publicity and helped her bookshop a bit. Um, and she lives in the next village, which is Corbridge. So it was a lot of fun to do. I mean, I, I, I think if you can um, make it fun, it works. Wow. Got a bit with her at, at one point, because she told the press that I was um, aiming for 10 pages a minute. And uh, I didn't want her to tell that, her that, tell everybody that. I thought I might not be able to do it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, in actual fact, I did really well on the day, so it worked very well. Amazing. Okay, so, so you, you have six world records in speed reading, is that right? Uh, I, I entered a competition which was held by the Mind Sports Olympiad, and you had to read an unpublished book, and it was speed times the percentage of questions you got right, and I was a person who scored the highest number of points in seven competitions in total. Seven. But it, it, though it was fun to do at the time, um, after a period of time I thought, well, I'll let somebody have a go. <laughs> 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 That's nice of you. Uh, and uh, now I quite like doing the, the fun events. I think that um, they present a challenge, and I only do them if I think I'm going to enjoy doing them. And, uh, you know, as I said, I was able to help friends, so, you know, hey. All right, so do you have a book nearby? Like, do you have one within reach? Um, oh, I've got oh, loads of books, but... Um, I just want to grab one and just thumb through it, the, the pace you read. I just want to visually see what is... Like, how fast do you turn a page? Chris, we're in the lounge, and the only thing that's in the lounge are 
cookery books. <laughs> Cookbooks, that's great. <laughs> Centre um, much of the challenge really in terms of reading. I can get one. If uh, yeah, go ahead. It's uh, I totally am fascinated by this. All right. So if you're if you're watching before she comes back, so yeah. Ann Jones has won um, seven international speed reading competitions like really big ones and she's read some really fun books faster than anybody else has on tv okay so you're back now let's let's take a look at this so you're gonna what do you have in front of you what book do you have unfortunately it's a it's a cookbook which is not ideal for speed reading <laughs> i think it's even funnier because it's got some <laughs> it's got look lists of shopping here i mean hey that you need to get to cook all the recipes and but reading a list versus reading a paragraph is one faster than the other. Um, it it's, depends what you want to do. I mean, essentially, if you want to scan information, um, you can use speed reading techniques to scan information. But if you want to um, read uh, for um, the purpose of actually sort of enjoying the book or sort of study. You can do an awful lot of different things. Um, if you're reading a study textbook, you can save yourself a lot of time by previewing it. Um, and that, it's not speed reading, but it's a, a good technique for people who have a lot to read. If you've got a lot to read. Yeah. Yeah, we've got a lot of non-fiction to read. You know, I've got a lot to read for work, but what I do, I'm a very much an auditory learner, and I don't read very well, honestly. So I do everything from an audio standpoint, so my computer actually reads most of the copy to me at a, at a really, really fast rate that most people are like, whoa, I can't even hear what the guy's saying when he reads, but it's, I'm used to it. It's really quite useful because, um, again, there's a big debate in, in speed reading about what we call subvocalization, hearing hmm. words in the head as you read. Huh. Uh, but subvocalization is actually very useful from a memory point of view. Cool. All right, so hold that book up. I just want to see, so when you're reading a book like that cookbook, do you, I, I, I mean, I how, you're flipping a page every, what, every eight seconds? If you're getting 10 pages a minute. Well, what happened, Chris, it's, speed reading is um, wow. skill. You can train yourself to do it. Yeah. A lot of people do it. I mean, for example, um, the method I use isn't far away from what Teddy Roosevelt used to use, or Franklin Delano Roosevelt, or, um, JFK or Margaret Thatcher. Hmm. What's actually happened is that the explanations for why it works have changed. Hmm. What I do, um, I wasn't really intending to talk about this today, um, is I do do a lot of work with people with dyslexia and I, I do it on a kind of a voluntary basis a lot of the time um, or I don't charge them as much as I would charge other people. Sure. Um, because Dyslexia is something, in terms of reading, you can do a lot to help. Um, the stuff that helps me be a, a great speed reader can help a dyslexic youngster be able to read at a normal rate. Mm. So that's why I, I, I do a lot of the things I do. Similarly, if you understand, you know, sort of what um, has happened in terms of people's brains, say you've got somebody with a brain injury, you can, um, you know, uh, there's a lot you can do to, to remedy problems. Mm. It's quite simple. It's not a big deal. That's Just, really you know, cool. Because yeah. you're actually getting to impact people's lives in a way that, honestly, um, they would feel like, hey, there's no fix for this. I've got dyslexia or I've got whatever it is that keeps me from being able to accomplish um, putting information into our heads that way. Which can really yeah. slow you down in school and career and everything else if you don't figure it out. Well, I wondered who'd actually su <laughs> suggested that I do this um, I Share Hope interview because I, I thought it might be one of the dyslexic people I've been working with. Hmm. Um, I have no idea why you chose me to be um, on, on well, the I can I can tell you that's, that's the easiest part of the answers that I get to answer. You, you've been chosen because you're bringing hope to people in a really unique way around the world. So we're interviewing a thousand people around the world. So in, in theory, if you look at that, every 8,000 people on the planet gets one representative on the survey. And we're trying to really get a good grasp of what 
uh, brings people hope and what drives hope forward in different communities around the world. And you're impacting a community that a lot of people aren't or don't even have any awareness of, not just the speed reading community, but the ones you're teaching. Yeah, uh, I mean, the, the, I do teach a lot of people how to speed read and um, I do it professionally, but I also work with people who've got problems with reading. Mm -hmm. um, for example, I, d I did some work with a group called Headway in um, Hexham, which is the nearest town. And at the time, um, the speed reading business wasn't doing ever so well because of the recession. And I had time on my hands, so I volunteered to do some work with them, um, the Brain Injured Support Group. Mm -hmm. and so um, with another group, which was um, a group of women who'd been in abusive relationships. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, I was teaching, I taught them the speed reading stuff um, and also things to do with memory because I, for years I've been um, trying every trick in the trade to remember information better because, you know, speed reading on its own isn't enough. You've got to be able to remember what you've read. Right. Um, and that was interesting and uh, inspiring, certainly with the uh, ladies that I worked with. Two of them have gone on to university. Wow. So it's made a difference to their lives. Yeah. But, you know, when you get that um, happening, it's, you can't, it's not a, it, it's just something very special, but it doesn't mm. happen every time. Oh, you know? wow. But it's special to the ones that it happens to. Yeah. Well, Anne, tell us this. So Anne Jones is with us from the UK, and she is answering our five questions of hope as one of the world's fastest readers and somebody who's helping so many other people. If the, if the skill of, of speed reading or just comprehension that is really unattainable for some people because of a issue like dyslexia or because they just want to read faster for their career and they just need to hire somebody to teach them how but either way and it's bringing hope to unique people groups so and five questions we ask the same five to everybody <laughs> okay. uh, what is your what's, your what's your favorite quote about hope or definition of hope it's from Alexander Pope's essay on man uh, he wrote a, a line which is, hope springs eternal in the human breast. Hmm. And um, I'm, I kind of imagine coils rather than water sloshing out. Um, because I think that hope is um, resilience, you bounce back. And I do think it's part of human nature. Um, and I, I think that if you're looking at what's happening now, um, for example, in the international scene, as far as Paris is concerned, mm -hmm. there's terrible, terrible massacre of Brazilians took place on Friday mm -hmm. um, in different parts of Paris. But what was interesting was the response of the French people. Mm -hmm. um, they shut down the metro, the subway, and so the taxi drivers took people home. They switched off the taxi meters and they took them home because people who've been caught up in those events, you know, um, very dazed, very, very bad way, um, they just took them home. Mm -hmm. And on social media, um, there's a hashtag, Port Ouvert, which stands for open door. So people who couldn't get back home could contact people who lived in the locality and there'd be somewhere for them to stay overnight. Mm -hmm. There were massive queues um, they couldn't accept all the queues, all the people in the queue for blood donors. Hmm. So that was just extraordinary. Lots of lots of small things that people did just to help other people. And I thought that was terribly inspirational. Mm -hmm. uh, I was trying to think of some examples on a national level um, of inspirational people and, and who really have made a difference. Now you'd think that when all hope had literally gone, <laughs> say you were a 15-year-old youngster who'd been diagnosed with cancer, mm -hmm. right, that you'd kind of give up and feel sorry for yourself. One guy who didn't was called Stephen Sutton, and I'll tell you his story because it's important in the UK. Um, mm -hmm. Stephen uh, died age 19, but in his short life he packed in a lot of things that he wanted to do. He had a kind of a bucket list. <laughs> <laughs> and he'd be on social media banging away on a drum kit or whatever. And he had a beautiful smile. And towards the end, uh, when he was, a, was really ill, 
um, he managed a huge grin and, and thumbs up hmm. uh, like that on on social media and wow. it went viral so thousands and thousands of people sort of tweeted pictures of themselves going thumbs up for Steve Sutton oh, wow. and he hmm. managed to raise five and a half million pounds for teenage cancer the teenage cancer trust wow so I said, uh, you know you'd think wouldn't it no hope at all but um, what he said was he didn't feel he, he didn't think about the future or feel sorry for himself he felt the opposite um, he said that his cancer had given him the opportunity to do something remarkable which was to educate people about cancer so if I had to sort of say I'd got a, an inspirational hero it would be that teenager Stephen Sutton but you'd think, you know, one guy like that, surely there can't be more. Um, but a local farmer, uh, his name is Stuart Ridley, um, a young man in his 20s, living on a farm with uh, his parents and two brothers. He loved sport and he played rugby at the Tyndale Rugby Club. And he was very well known because he was a bit of a joker. He was always playing tricks and making everybody laugh. A marvellous personality and he had an inoperable brain tumour and then suddenly all the way around in the towns and villages up and down the Tyne Valley people wearing t-shirts saying stay, stay strong stew try saying that quickly <laughs> <laughs> and they got uh, uh, wristbands and so on and his family raised an enormous amount of money for um, uh, you know, again, for, for the charities associated with the illness that uh, mm. Stuart had. So, you know, you'd think that that was, you know, it, it happens so many times. And you sort of think, well, thank goodness there are people on the planet like that, you know, mm. are very encouraging. Yeah. Um, and we all have heroes and heroines in our own family. On the walls behind me, you'll see some of the um, pictures that were done by my sister Alison. Oh, wow. Uh, she was, became ill and lost her job. <laughs> mm. So she decided to be an artist. She trained in, in art when she was younger. And uh, she produced some wonderful, wonderful work in a very short period of time. Um, and, uh, you know, sadly, Alison isn't with us anymore. Mm. But the energy and the enthusiasm she put into her pictures is a constant inspiration for everybody in our family. So there's inspiration everywhere if you choose to look for it. Wow, what a great set of examples. The pictures are beautiful. Yeah. She's really left a legacy. Wow. Yeah. So, and I never heard that quote in the context of a spring. I always pictured it as water gushing forth from a spring. Never thought about it being a resiliency and a bouncing back and a. Yeah. Um, a, a new life that comes from that, you know? To be fair, I think Alexander Pope thinks of it as a spring. Huh. I think I'm the one that's being silly here. But you quite often hear people say, you know, that they're hoping for something to happen, and then somebody will say in a sarcastic tone, oh, hope springs eternal, you know, as if, you know, they're being ridiculously optimistic. But um, I actually think it's quite a good, the spring is quite a good idea. In fact, I did a mind map of what, I was going to talk to you about here. And oh, I love it. As the, uh, I'll email it across if you like to your assistant. That's beautiful. Yeah. Oh, please do. Please yeah. do. I'll put it on my Twitter feed as well. Okay. Um, anyway, yeah, so it, it's useful. Um, I, I kind of, when I'm thinking of uh, hope, I think of the resilience. Mm -hmm. And of course, when you face difficulties, um, you do need to bounce back. Mm -hmm. and it seems to me, it's a very simple thing, um, that if you're in a difficult situation and you feel it's hopeless, then it may be that you have to accept that the situation is as it is, but there is always one thing that you can do, and that is to change how you think about it. Mm. So, um, if you are in an awkward situation, for example, as I mentioned to you, suddenly work dried up and I, I could have panicked. I did panic. But I thought, <laughs> I've got some free time that I wasn't expecting. I'll put it to use and local community and give something back. So that's what I did. I made a lot of friends who are still friends. Mm -hmm. And 
it uh, it makes a, a, a difference to them and it makes it a huge difference to me because I feel mm. that myself. Beautiful. So who has influenced you most with hope? Who's given you the most hope and shared the most with you? You may have already mentioned one of them in your yeah. comments a minute ago. but um, I think that uh, there are family members who constantly inspire me. Mm. Right? Um, they're not with us now, some of them. I can think of my father who ended up behind Japanese lines mm. with me group of RAF mm. uh, people that he was commanding and he had to make his way back to safety um, and that I think was very difficult because you know they were being eaten alive by all sorts of creatures mm. and they, they got malaria and so on and one of them died mm. um, but they kept battling through the jungle and eventually made their way out um, and he didn't give up Mm. never gave up hope mm. and then there was my mother who um, was an army nurse one of the ones that shipped over with the troops at D-Day and uh, <laughs> when I was looking through her papers um, she never spoke about this to us at all um, she was engaged to someone and there was a picture of them standing on the beach mm. um, she never talked about this person, and there was a, a little card with a menu on it <laughs> saying, Je vous aime, I love you. Oh. Um, and obviously this guy had died. Mm. Um, but again, she and her fellow nurses were sort of um, working in terrible conditions in Normandy. Mm. They would have shells flying over overhead. They went to sleep with... Um, tin plate over their stomachs in case of shrapnel. Wow. One of the nurses got a medal for rescuing someone from a burning tent and the nurses all laughed about it because that's what they were doing day in, day out. <laughs> yeah. So, Amazing. you know, I don't have to, to look far. Um, I really don't. But I think the inspiration of Alison who, having become ill, lost a job, decided that she was going to resume art and produced so much work in such a short space of time. Mm. Um, I'll never forget that. Mm. Mm. Beautiful. All right, what's been a time in your life when you've had to really rely on hope to pull you through? Um, I think there's always times in people's lives when you know, you've got a family member who's ill uh, and there isn't a lot you can do. Mm -hmm. um, and sooner or later it comes to all of us that that will happen that there'll be somebody you really love who's very ill and there is very little to do about it um, I think what you do is you, you get through it because you reach out to other people you know, um, relatives perhaps who you know, we're all in this together we're all sort of in that situation Mm -hmm. where um, you are sort of reaching out to others. Um, I'm very fortunate. I've got a very supportive family in a lot of ways, brothers and sisters who care about each other. Mm -hmm. So you find the strength there. Um, so I think if you were depressed or you were struggling with depression, which again is something that, let's face it, we all suffer from from time to time. I do, yeah. Yeah. The, the only way forward is really to um, think about other people. Mm. E and even if you're just doing something like smiling. <laughs> and in the end, that's all Steve Sutton could do. He, he was laying on his deathbed, bless him, and he put his thumbs up and smiled. Big chip of grin. Mm -hmm. um, and the tremendous courage just to do that. But sometimes just smiling, um, asking other people how they are, you know, sort of talking to them, um, and listening to what they say, and, you know, seeing if you can help them in some way or other. But if you make that shift from, hey, oh, to, hey, <laughs> yeah. you're on the, on the way up. Hmm. And it, it, it's each little step. I agree. I agree. Oh, thanks so much for answering these questions. 
Question four is, what are you doing today to share hope with others around you? Um, You've already mentioned some of this with your work, with your reading and helping people who aren't just clients, but are actually needing, uh, needing help in other ways, just comprehension reading, but anything else that you want to mention? Well, I think the simple things that I do are, um, you know, taking an interest in other people, as I said, that's you know, fairly basic. The village where I live is probably pretty much like towns in the States. At the moment, um, lots of fundraising is going on for people in Syria, refugees, mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, there are always things like um, uh, events where they're raising money for charity. That happens all the time, day in, day out. Um, the local village hall opens twice a week for a coffee morning so that the old people, older people in the village who retire can go and have a coffee and talk with their friends. Mm -hmm. So um, I support that by helping with the washing up, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I'm great at washing up. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, not so good at making cakes, but other people will do that. So there's, there's always plenty of things to do if you want to, to help and pitch in. Um, and there are a lot of fun when you get around to doing them as well. <laughs> awesome. I love that. Well, oh, oh, <laughs> I think washing the dishes sounds like a, a perfect job for me. Well, well, and make a spot. You don't just wash the dishes. You talk to the other people in the kitchen and you make friends and that, it's... There's always that, you know, virtuous circle going on there, mm -hmm. which helps a lot. I love that. All right, so question five. How can I start sharing hope? Or anybody who's listening in and watching right now um, when this airs, how can we share hope? So I'm going to hang up the, the call here in a minute, and I'm going to go about my day. What do I do next? The simple steps, A, B, C, one, two, three stuff. Well... I think what you're doing already, Chris, is more than most people will achieve in a lifetime. You're talking to people, listening to what they have to say, um, getting the word out about things to do. Uh, I think that's a, a great thing. Mm. You know, I mean, if we think about how many people do we talk to in a year, um, I don't know, actually talk to, them, listen to what they're saying. How many real in-depth conversations do we have? Mm. Not very many. Not very many. Okay. Um, and you're doing this on a daily basis. Wow! <laughs> <laughs> it's a privilege. I'm so excited I get to. <laughs> yeah. I think, you know, it's only because nice people like you are willing to answer the phone. <laughs> yeah. I think the thing to do is to just uh, talk to people, listen. Um, if you see that they're looking sad, you know, you know, ask them if they're all right, and if um, they uh, do have a problem or an issue, then listen to what they have to say about it. Sometimes um, that's enough. Mm -hmm. you know? uh, sometimes another human being are uh, just, you know, paying attention to someone who's got a problem is a real big help. Mm -hmm. And obviously, if there's something that you feel you can do to offer help, then, you know, offer it, but check it's the right sort of help and it's what they want, mm. you know, from you, before mm. you um, dive in. It's <laughs> <laughs> a good point. <laughs> Amazing. It's, it's listening that's the important thing. You're great at it, Chris. Well, oh, you're sweet for telling me that and you're sweet for talking. You're the one sharing your heart and your story and it means so much to me and I know so much to, we have people listening and I think 45 or so countries around the world in multiple languages and I'm not sure how the transcriptions get made. I don't do them, but somebody's out there doing them and it's, it's really cool to watch. So thank you for sharing with people who obviously want to know more about hope. So how can we follow you and see you on social media websites? What do you have that we can keep up with? Well, I would, um, <laughs> I'm absolutely useless at social media. I'm too busy talking to people. Um, but uh, if you want to sort of have a look at my website, it's www.speedyreader.co.uk. And I've got a, a Twitter site, which is Anne Jones at 53 Leads, which kind of um, 
you know, I'll sort of say what it is I'm doing. But if anybody um, is interested in what I do, uh, you know, you can always drop me an email. I, I, you know, um, and again, you find the email address on the website. Okay. Yeah. And that website is speedyreader.co.uk. Got it. And your Twitter handle was Ann Jones fifty three reads, like reads a book. Le le no leaves, like leaves that fall down. Oh, the leaves. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. I didn't hear that right. So Ann Jones fifty three leaves, like on a tree. Yeah. Well, Got it. Essentially, I love visiting gardens, and I've got lots of trees in my garden. <laughs> I love that. And in case anybody's wondering, Ann is spelled with an E in this case. So A N N E J O N E S. Right. You well, know. My mother-in-law's name is Ann Jones. All right. And you're well, both wonderful people. Uh, news for you, Chris. Um, my maiden name was Ann Williams. No way! Yeah. That's, uh, that's truly a small world right there. <laughs> that's great. So, obviously my wife's name is, is Jill Williams now, but it was Jill Jones. Isn't that crazy? What a weird yes, coincidence. Yes, you know, it's a very common name in Wales. You've probably got some Welsh ancestry somewhere, and so is your wife, you know. I'll, I'll try to figure that out. I wish I could figure out the genealogy, but I just need to take the time to do it. <laughs> yeah, um, everything takes time. You've got to figure out what you put your time into. But I think you found something very worthwhile, and um, mm. I, I wish you all the best with your thousand interviews. Well, thank you for being one of the thousand. It's truly a privilege to talk to you. And if I'm, if I'm getting this right, we've been talking for 31 minutes exactly right now. So that means you would have read 310 pages yeah. if we had just been sitting here reading. I feel like I've wasted your entire day. You could have read another book by now. Well, <laughs> I kind of sort of think one book a day is enough. I've got to move around more. Um, <laughs> you just said one book a day. <laughs> Most people do that once a month, if that. Uh, it, it gets a bit tedious. So when I went to the library yesterday, um, I picked out a book, and the librarian has a system. And, so, and she said, well, you've read that one already. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so is there anything you pick up and you say, oh, no, this is so hard to read? Um, romances. Because <laughs> you want to take your time and think it through and feel the book versus just information? I just, I just can't stand them. Um, uh, I like um, science fiction, fantasy, adventure likes of um, Terry Pratchett I really love. Um, at the moment there are lots of really good writers of crime fiction. Mm -hmm. And uh, my favorite book of the last year has been Emily St. John Mandel, Station Eleven. Which okay. is a, it won the Arthur C. Clarke Award. I think it's really good. Huh. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's a case of, um, you know, yes, I can read a lot of things very fast. Um, but a lot of the time, you know, I'm doing the usual things that other people do, which is, you know, cooking. Um, so, gardening, that kind of thing, seeing friends. Uh, and I think one book a day is quite enough for anybody. <laughs> All right, so just a couple fast random questions. So you're reading, you're, you're in a restaurant, you walk in with your friends, family, whatever, and you all sit down, you open your menus. Are you like, open the menu, okay, I'm done. Or do you read it slow like everybody else? I don't make a, a I can read fast and I can read slow. Um, but I've got to the point where I don't really think about what I'm doing. Um, if I'm in a restaurant, I'll okay. just look at the menu, and I do make up my mind pretty quickly. Um, so it, it, it's, it can be quite funny. Um, <laughs> for example, uh, there was a guy who I was on, on television a few years ago, and um, they had a set of questions. And I wasn't expecting them to be in the format that uh, they were, and to, you know, I thought that um, it was going to be done differently. So he said, look, here, <laughs> and gave me a sheet of paper. I said, you weren't going to do that like that. And he sort of gave me a funny look, and I realized I read it very quickly, and he was kind of astonished. Um, but I, I kind of just got so used to doing it like that, I don't really think it's anything special. That's know? awesome. Um, so, uh, I, I don't think it, don't really notice it either, no. 
Your family doesn't, because they're used to seeing you do things at that pace. Yeah. And I think that, um, you know, you don't have to read everything fast. You can read stuff slowly. Um, but, you know, sometimes if you've got a long um, journey and you've only got kind of one book with you, hmm. then I'm not going to rush through it, you know. And I also think 800 to 1500 is a good range of speeds. I don't think it's worth... Um, I, you know, I think that's a, a, a good range, you know. I mean, the sort of speeds I have to do for events, sure. I train for them, you know. Yeah, like an athlete. I mean, it truly is an athletic skill in a sense, yeah, a mental and athletic skill. It is, because you have to train your eyes to follow a guide very quickly, and you have to train um, your eyes to sort of take in larger areas of text. So you might be reading six to eight areas of text per page. Wow, and were you a good reader as a child? I, always, I loved reading, but I didn't learn to uh, speed read until I was over 40, and I had a, a reading speed of somewhere between 200 and 250 words per minute. And then I read a book about speed reading and got up to about, well, got to 368. Um, and then I trained, and I got up to 1050 on the day of training. I was the slowest person in the room. <laughs> wow. But you see, the point was that um, I also had three children at school and a full-time job, and I needed to use it to keep on top of the workload that I had at the time. Hmm. So it's a case of um, you know using the opportunities that are available to you. So I, I I got kept on top of the reading side of the job very easily. Brilliant, literally, <laughs> brilliant. Well, you know. <laughs> I don't think I'm anything special, Chris. So, you know, hey, um, if you, it's not a, a difficult skill to learn. What is special about it is that um, it's kind of consistently doing it. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. So, it's a bit like anything else, really. Well, I'll let you go because you have, um, in the next 30 minutes, I'm sure you'll knock out another book so you can check your book a day off. And <laughs> <laughs> I'll muddle through the next chapter of mine. As I say, it's not a, a big deal. It really isn't. I think what is important is um, the stuff that I do, which helps people who've got reading difficulties to be able to read at all. Mm. And that, that's the stuff that makes a difference. Mm. Yeah? And all the books, I used to listen to those while I was doing the ironing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, because it was the only way I could actually sort of um, get through a book at the weekend. You know, I'd kind of listen to them as I did the chores around the house. Uh, auditory books are, are great, and that's a set of circumstances because you can quite often do um, something like washing the dishes and listening to um, a book at the same time. Mm. So I, I wouldn't knock the auditory books, I think they're very good. I think the main thing is the information in the books. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it <laughs> that's is. That's the key issue. Really. So many out there to read, I'd love that. Okay, well, Ann Jones, you have been inspirational to me, and I know many others have used, have used, helped them retain information and the things that you do on a voluntary basis, from washing dishes to helping people with dyslexia to, to getting people up and ready to attack college or a higher education level because they couldn't for whatever life circumstances before. Fantastic. You also, so humble, even though you have seven world speedy reading championships and records for reading fun books like The Deathly Hallows with Harry Potter and so many other things. You've just been a treat to talk to. Thank you for your time and your care to so many and to us. Really appreciate it. Well, thank you, Chris, and uh, good luck with your project. Okay. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye. Our conversation with Ann Jones, such a treat. Six or I think seven times she has won the World Speed Reading Championship. It's just incredible. So literally, we were talking for, I think, 36 minutes at that point. So she would have read 360 pages of your average size book, which is just phenomenal. Wow, it blows my mind. And with, with really, really good comp uh, comprehension. So anyway, Anne, thanks for your time. Hey, you can find out more about Anne at our website, isharehope.com, or over at her website, which is Speedy Reader. That's S-P-E-E-D-Y. Reader is R E A D E R dot C O dot U K, speedyreader dot C O 
www.ghostbusiness.uk. You can find our email address there. We'll also put social media links and things like that, uh, videos, her mind map, which she held up on the screen here. If you're watching the YouTube version of this, good for you. If not, then uh, we'll, we'll post on the website as well if you listen to this, just audio. Her mind map of hope and how that works is really, really cool. She did a really great job explaining that. So anyway, hope to see you soon. Jump in on, on my social media anytime you want. Chris Williams HQ. That's uh, at all social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, wherever you want to go. Chris Williams HQ. You'll find me there and I would love to hear your answers to these five questions. Please let me know your definition of hope, your favorite quote about hope, or a special time when hope has really pulled you through. Or if you're struggling to find hope like I do some days, shoot something over to me. Let me see if we can talk that through. Love to get engaged. Thanks. Talk to you soon. Have a great day. Thanks for being part of this community. You've just listened to I Share Hope. If you're ready to make a change, head to our website at isharehope.com and claim your free copy of the top 10 actions of hope from world leaders to use hope in your own life. Thanks for listening, and we'll talk to you next time. Yeah. Yeah, we've got a lot of non-fiction to read. You know, I've got a lot to read for work, but what I do, I'm a very much an auditory learner, and I don't read very well, honestly. So I do everything from an audio standpoint. So my computer actually reads most of the copy to me at a, at a really, really fast rate that most people are like, whoa, I can't even hear what the guy's saying when he reads, but it's, I'm used to it. It's really quite useful because, um, again, there's a big debate in in speed reading about what we call subvocalization, hearing mm. words in the head as you read. Huh. Uh, but subvocalization is actually very useful from a memory point of view. Cool. All right, so hold that book up. I just want to see, so when you're reading a book like that cookbook, do you, uh, I, I mean, I how, you're flipping a page every, what, every eight seconds? If you're getting 10 pages a minute. Well, what happened, Chris, it's, speed reading is um, wow. skill. You can train yourself to do it. Yeah. A lot of people do it. I mean, for example, um, the method I use isn't far away from what Teddy Roosevelt used to use, or Franklin Delano Roosevelt, or um, JFK, or Margaret Thatcher. Hmm. What's actually happened is that the explanations for why it works have changed. Hmm. What I do, um, I wasn't really intending to talk about this today. Um, is I do do a lot of work with people with dyslexia and I, I do it on a kind of a voluntary basis a lot of the time at the bookshop a bit um, and she lives in the next village which is Coolbridge so it was a lot of fun to do I mean I, I, I think if you can um, make it fun it works wow. got a bit with her at, at one point because she told the press that I was um, aiming for 10 pages a minute and uh, I didn't want her to tell that, her that tell everybody that I thought I might not be able to do it you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, in actual fact I did really well on the day so it worked very well amazing okay so so you you have six world records in speed reading is that right uh, I, I entered a competition which was held by the mind sports Olympiad and you had to read an unpublished book and it was speed times the percentage of questions you got right and I was a person who scored the highest number of points in seven competitions in total. Seven. But it, it, though it was fun to do at the time, um, after a period of time I thought, well, I'll let somebody have a go. <laughs> <laughs> That's <laughs> nice of you. Uh, and uh, now I quite like doing the, the fun events. I think that um, they present a challenge, and I only do them if I think I'm going to enjoy doing them. And, uh, you know, as I said, I was able to help friends, so, you know, hey. All right, so do you have a book nearby? Like, do you have one within reach? Um, oh, I've got oh, loads of books, but... Um, I just want to grab one and just thumb through it, the, the pace you read. I just want to visually see what is... Like, how fast do you turn a page? Chris, we're in the lounge, and the only thing that's in the lounge are cookery books. <laughs> Cookbooks, that's great. <laughs> that's not <laughs> um, much of a challenge, really, in terms of Get one uh, yeah, go ahead. It's, uh, I totally am fascinated by this. All right, so if you're, if you're watching before she comes back, so Ann Jones has won um, seven 
international speed reading competitions, like really big ones, and she's read some really fun books faster than anybody else has on TV. Okay, so you're back. Now let's, let's take a look at this. So you're going to, what do you have in front of you? What book do you have? Unfortunately, it's a, it's a cookbook, which is not ideal for speed reading. <laughs> I think it's even funnier. Because it's got some, <laughs> it's got look, lists of shopping here. I mean, hey, that you need to get to cook all the recipes and so on. And there are but reading a list versus reading a paragraph, is one faster than the other? Um, it it's, depends what you want to do. I mean, essentially, if you want to scan information, um, you can use speed reading techniques to scan information, but if you want to um, read uh, for um, the purpose of actually sort of enjoying the book or sort of study, you can do an awful lot of different things. Um, if you're reading a study textbook, you can save yourself a lot of time by previewing it. Um, and that, it's not speed reading, but it's a, a good well, I had to do it for, um, I, I did it for um, fun, really, but in actual fact, I was asked to do it for um, Sky News yeah. and uh, various other newspapers. And I've stopped competing in world championships now, and what I do is, for fun, I sort of speed read um, books that uh, the press want to talk about. Okay. And Harry Potter wasn't my favourite book for speed reading. It was actually the... Um, Harper Lee book that came out in July huh. and I had uh, I finished that in 25 minutes and 31 seconds and there's a huge group of journalists in the room and um, I was filmed by a number of TV companies including the BBC and Sky no. but such a great book um, and uh, a challenging read I really enjoyed it I, you know, I, I like the Harry Potter. There's a lot of hype around that. Yeah. But I thought the uh, Go Set a Watchman book was a better read. Wow. So you you read it in 25 minutes, 25 yeah. and a half minutes, basically. Yeah, but I trained hard for that, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> well, when I say I trained hard, it wasn't hard. I basically, sort of, um, for about a month beforehand, I read To Kill a Mockingbird at a faster and faster speed. Um, every day. So my goal was to read To Kill a Mockingbird in about 45 minutes um, and to get a speed of about 10 pages per minute. And I was doing it for this particular event for a friend of mine who has a bookshop and she wanted to get some publicity and she got massive publicity and it helped. When you face difficulties, you do need to bounce back. It seems to me it's a very simple thing. But if you're in a difficult situation and you feel it's hopeless, then it may be that you have to accept that the situation is as it is, but there is always one thing you can do, and that is to change how you think about it. Welcome to I Share Hope, the podcast where world leaders share their real stories of hope and how you can use actionable hope to start changing your life today. And now, here's your host, Chris Williams. Chris. And Jones, how are you doing? I'm fine, how are you? I'm great, thanks for talking today, I really appreciate your time. That's fine. So it is 2pm in the UK, where exactly are you located? In a little village, um, in the middle of Northumberland. Oh. I can look out over a stream just rolling into the River Tyne. In wow. front of me. That's not even fair, that's so beautiful, wow. We've never been to the UK, but my wife and I and our kids really want to visit there. Really do. Like, Jill really does. She's, we hope to spend a month there at some point and just settle into somewhere, not in a big city, but just, just to relax and slow down. Mm. Well, yeah. Sounds like you got a good place. Yeah. yeah it sounds like you've got a good plan. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. All right, Anne, so tell me this. If, if I'm correct, you have read Harry Potter and the Deathly Hollows faster than anyone else on the planet. Is that true? Mm 